Welcome to our meeting. Thank you for coming. Thank you, David, uh, for your introduction. Can I begin by reading the scriptures uh, from the book of Revelation? And we're in chapter number six, the book of Revelation, chapter six. And we'll begin our reading in verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? We'll end our reading at that point, knowing that the Lord will certainly add the blessing to the reading of his inspired and inerrant word. Let's just bow for a brief moment's prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless it to us tonight as we delve into it and pray uh, that we might get a handle on what's happening in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You have stolen my dreams. These are now the familiar words of Greta Thunberg, a teenage climate activist who has been thrust into the limelight. She blames world leaders and governments for climate change and accuses them of robbing her and her generation of a future. She claims that if the world had the will, climate change as a result of a warming planet would be and could be checked. Is she right? Is mankind solely responsible for global warming that's threatening the planet? And could we, if we all got together, do something about it? Certainly, we would have to admit that she is right about the planet heating up, the consequences of which may not be far away from the scientific predictions that are made in respect to it. But she's wrong about it being entirely of man's own making. Although mankind's mismanagement of the planet has certainly contributed, she's completely wrong about being able to do anything significant about global warming. Greta's dreams will end up being nightmares. And she or her activist friends or world governments will be helpless to do anything about it. You see, the planet is careering towards the climactic disaster that actually is predicted in the Bible. It was predicted many thousands of years ago. Now, there are several things about this coming catastrophe, and it will be a catastrophe that I want us to consider. First of all, the certainty of future climate catastrophe. The certainty of future climate catastrophe. Is climate change real? Yes, it is. Is man solely responsible? Well, we could answer that question, yes and no, and we would be right. The climate is definitely changing, but whether or not man is solely responsible and can do anything about it, well, that's an entirely different story. In his book, The Global Warming Deception, Grant Jeffrey says, the basic argument behind anthropogenic global warming, man-made global warming, is not based on observable measured evidence of higher temperature readings, but on computer model predictions. According to Jeffrey's, the climate change models 
either do not include or greatly minimize the impact of cloud formations, solar radiation cycles, volcanic eruptions, and the massive climate effects of El Nino or La Nina. Jeffrey's view is that man-made climate change is not as clear cut as is being suggested. And he would uh, suggest to us that actually uh, it's all a bit of a con. And again, uh, to a certain degree, he might not be all that far wrong. Elsewhere in his book, he puts a minuscule figure on the impact uh, we would have if indeed we managed to cut carbon emissions to near zero, which of course is our government's plan by 2050. The point being that the notion that somehow mankind uh, can somehow check or arrest uh, the advance of global warming is no more than wishful thinking. However, that is not to say that some kind of warming is taking place. Even if we were to accept all of Jeffrey's evidence, we could not deny that climate change is happening and it's only going to get worse. The Bible predicts as much. Jesus said there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places, all of which are related to a certain degree to climate change, either the cause of it or the results of it. Now, when we examine the prophetic scriptures, it becomes clear that there will be a climate catastrophe in the future. No question about it. And that brings us then, secondly, to the character of future climate catastrophe, the character of future climate catastrophe. What will such a climate catastrophe look like? Well, the prophets Zephaniah and Joel in particular paint a graphic and gloomy picture of future climate catastrophe. Zephaniah tells us that when this day comes, that it will be a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And if we take scripture literally, and we should, uh, then the suggestion is that there will be uh, uh, things that will happen uh, to our climate that will cause these things. And Joel speaks of wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. But it is the book of Revelation where these things are most graphically expressed. In chapter 6, the chapter that we read from, when the seven seals are open, we're told that John saw a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. In other words, a predicted famine, a cataclysmic famine, the likes of which has never been seen on earth before. In the same chapter, uh, we read of a great earthquake and the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair and the moon becoming as blood. The stars of heaven uh, fell onto the earth and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. These are, to say the least, cataclysmic events, catastrophic events, and they will prove so for those who live on planet Earth at that time. And if that were not bad enough, there's worse to follow. For when the trumpets are blown, we're told that hail and fire mingled with blood uh, will uh, be evident, and, and they are cast upon the Earth. The third part of the trees were burnt up, and all the grass was burnt up. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made better. And the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. 
so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. On and on the nightmare continues with little respite. For when the next series of judgments are poured out, the vile judgments, we're told that the sea became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea and the rivers and the fountains of waters became blood. The sun scorched men with fire and they were scorched with great heat. The final disaster of this future period is also graphically described in the book of Revelation in chapter 16, where we read, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great, and every island fled away and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of the heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. My friends, the likes of this has never before been seen. Its description surpasses the worst case scenario of even those who are lobbying today in respect to climate change and what we should do about it. That, that brings us then to the casualties of future climate change. Casualties of future climate change. The future climate casualties are, of course, mankind, animals, and the planet's vegetation. While its effect on animals and plants are, of course, important, our main concern is what effect it will have on people. The future climate catastrophe will be detrimental to the human population as nothing else in history. And I, I repeat it, the future climate catastrophe will be detrimental to the human population as nothing else in history, despite the fact that in our last century, we saw two world wars. 21st century humanity is still reeling from the effects of the last century of warfare that saw the planet engaged in, in, in those two devastating wars and indeed other conflicts before, between and beyond. Millions lost their lives in these encounters. But compared to what will happen when the future climate change catastrophe occurs, it will seem almost incidental. And the best source of information on human casualties at this time is, of course, the Bible, not the computer predictions of the climate change lobbyists, but the Bible, the Word of God, and in particular, the book of Revelation. In Revelation 9, it's predicted that, and I want you to understand this figure, the third part of men would be killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone. If this were to happen today, right now, that would mean that 2.5 billion people would die. That's a staggering figure. 2.5 billion. In another passage later on in the same book, the third part of men, we're told, would be killed. Potentially a further third, this is. After one climate event, we're told that every living soul died in the sea, and that includes man and beast. Revelation speaks further uh, of suffering that uh, may also be as a result of climate change. In one verse, it says, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men. Now, the effect of this, or the effect that this will have, will be that men will, as we found out in our reading earlier, hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. So awful will this time be that we're told that in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. In other words, to get away from all of this, uh, they would consider that their best option would be to die. But it won't happen. What about the cause of future climate catastrophe? The cause of it. What's the cause of all this? Well, 
Is it part of the natural cycle? Is it as a result of man's abuse of the planet? Well, of course, there is a natural cycle. And in all honesty, we would have to admit that the earth has warmed before. But it has not led to the catastrophe, catastrophe predicted in the scriptures. It's also true that man has abused the planet and he continues to do so. But can I say that however much he does, it will not lead to anywhere near the crisis levels that the prophets and John were shown and spoke of. But the crisis, you could say in a sense, is man-made. It's not down to his mismanagement of the world's resources or the disgraceful levels of pollution on land, sea and air. No, it's the accumulation of human sin and disregard for God. So in that sense, it's man-made. Paul the Apostle, in a sermon on Mars Hill in Athens, said, God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. Friends, that judgment will begin at the time of the tribulation, which as far as scripture is concerned, is a period of unparalleled judgment that's coming upon the earth. Now, when we read of it, it's variously designated. Sometimes it's called the great tribulation. At other times, it's called uh, the day of his wrath. And still at other times, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. The psalmist presents the case for judgment in the second psalm. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Another scripture says that this event is for the purpose of, and I quote, trying them that dwell upon the earth. But it's the prophet Isaiah who summarizes it best for us, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Judgment is being stored up today. The nations are storing up judgment for the day of judgment. And God will one day, perhaps soon, unleash his judgment upon this planet. You see, sin has consequences, both for this life and for the life to come. And man cannot continue to sin with a high hand as he has done so down the centuries and get away with it. It simply isn't possible. What about the Christian and the future climate catastrophe? The Christian and the future climate catastrophe. If you're a Christian, can I say you, you need not fear this event? Because you see, believers have been exempted from it. This time is a time of judgment. It's a specific time of judgment. We already intimated that it's the time that's uh, known as or designated the time of God's wrath or the wrath of the Lamb. But you see, the wonderful truth is that believers are not appointed to wrath. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a prior appointment, uh, an appointment with Christ. Therefore, we'll not be able to keep the appointment the world has with wrath. Jesus promised, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the art of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Before these events take place, true believers will be raptured or translated from the earth. In fact, according to Revelation 4 and verse 4, the church will be in heaven 
before the tribulation begins on earth. If you have your Bibles open, perhaps you would turn to that passage in Revelation chapter 4. And the scene is in heaven before the tribulation begins on earth. And verse 4 reads, And round about the throne were four beasts and twenty seats, uh, sorry, four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. This is a representative company. There are 24 of them, just as there were 24 courses of priests. It's also a redeemed company. They're uh, clothed in white raiment, the garb of the redeemed. They must be uh, a rewarded and resurrected company because they have on their heads crowns of gold. And if they're a rewarded company, they most certainly will be a resurrected company because uh, in Luke uh, 14, I think it is, in verse 14, uh, we're told that the reward will be at the resurrection of the just. So this uh, company in heaven before the tribulation begins on earth can be no other company but the church. Who else fits the frame? It can't be Israel because Israel is on earth during the tribulation. It can't be angels because angels are not redeemed. Don't we sometimes sing it? It's a song holy angels cannot sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Why can they not sing it? Because they know nothing uh, of personal redemption, but you and I do. So this company is in heaven before the tribulation begins on earth. For those, however, who are not believers, a different fate awaits. When the rapture occurs to transport Christians to glory, unbelievers will be left behind to suffer in the great tribulation. And that will be followed by eternal hell. Dear friends, these are serious issues. After speaking of the comfort of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, the apostle turns to the horror of the tribulation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And here uh, he says, speaking of unsaved people, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Just like a thief who comes unexpectedly or a pregnant woman who all of a sudden goes into labor. So too will the events we've been speaking of come upon the world. Now, let me say this. The rapture is not the coming of the thief in the night. The rapture is the coming of the bridegroom for his bride. The thief in the night steals and takes away. The coming of the bridegroom is an altogether more glorious happening. What a day that will be. You can't do anything about it when it happens. But you can do something about it now. Not join some lobby group to campaign against global warming. But put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. He died on the cross to deal with your sin and union with him will exempt us from the wrath to come. That brings us then to the climax of future climate catastrophe. When will the climate change catastrophe end? Will there be an end to it? Well, dear friends, it will end, and it will end when Jesus returns to the earth. The return of the Lord is a two-staged event. He will come to the earth for his church before the future climate catastrophe. Then seven years later, he will come to the earth with his church and end the climate catastrophe. In fact, the climate will dramatically change then, and it will change for the better. We welcome a change in the climate. We should do as Christians, because there's going to be one. The book of Acts, according to uh, one of Peter's sermons, uh, reads as follows. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be, may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come, 
from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. One commentator says, the meaning of the times of refreshing and restitution of all things could be summed up as Genesis again. Genesis again. In other words, a return to the perfect conditions before the fall. Other scriptures certainly verify Peter's claim that at the return of Christ, there will be a positive climate change. We hear today all the talk about negative climate change. Well, here's a positive climate change. Isaiah says, then shall he give the rain of thy seed and thou shalt sow the ground with all, the bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Jeremiah continues in similar vein. The planters shall plant and shall eat them as common things. Therefore, they shall come and sing for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And Ezekiel says, I will call for the corn and will increase it. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the thing. And there are other prophets who who chip in jewel promises for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength, the floors uh, shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Let's not stop there. The prophet Amos, not to be left out, says, The days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the traitor, a traitor of grapes, grapes rather, uh, him that soweth, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. They shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. What wonderful climate changes. Absolutely amazing. Now this period of plenty and prosperity, known as the millennium, can only be entered by the narrow way. Jesus, preaching about this coming uh, kingdom, uh, issued this stern warning to those who would seek to access it. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for the wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He alone is the way. As he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Friends, there is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that there is a climate emergency coming. A terrifying sequence of events that will ravage the earth and and, and leave it in a, a state that is almost unrecognizable. Can I say, it's unstoppable. And Greta, let me tell you this. You have no future if you and your friends don't come to Christ. But believers, those who trust in Jesus, we are exempt. Therefore, it would be wise, would it not, all you who are listening to the sound of my voice this evening, if you're not a Christian, to become a Christian and flee from the wrath of come to come. Come to Christ. For with him, the future of the planet is glorious. We look forward to a transformed planet. We look forward to what the Bible predicts, heaven on earth. May God bless, bless his word to our hearts. Let's just pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it spells out very plainly what's going to happen. The world is worried about uh, a climate catastrophe. There's one coming. Lord, mankind can't stop it. 
we can get to zero emissions, we can plant more trees, we can uh, build more wind farms, but or none of these things will uh, really affect what's going on because, Lord, you've decided that judgment is coming and your word describes that judgment in graphic detail. And so we pray uh, that you would help us to warn people of the coming wrath and point them to Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask it. Amen.